Does goalies being allowed to wrap their sticks only with black tape sound too specific? Are legal hand passes too weird? Welcome to the NHL rulebook, and here are rules you didn't know existed. Too many men? It could end up in a penalty. Shots having too many men in the ice a normal minor penalty? Yes, it is, and no, it isn't. It's a minor penalty if there are too many men on the ice by accident. However, some people have done so on purpose in the past, and the league has had to amend their rules to reflect this. Legendary coach Roger Nielsen was constantly pushing the boundaries of the NHL regulations. Nielsen would continue to send out players while killing off a 5-on-3 penalty in this situation, knowing that his team couldn't be penalized any longer. Other times, coaches have purposely disrupted a breakaway or an odd man rush by sending another defender over the boards. Doesn't it appear to be a wise strategy? So astute that the league had to include this regulation to penalize teams with a penalty shot if they purposely sent too many guys onto the ice. The puck cannot be played from the penalty box. The great majority of the time, a player who has been called for a penalty just rejoins the action or skates to the bench. Occasionally, the player departing the box will be able to take an outlet pass from a teammate, resulting in an exhilarating breakaway that signifies an instant change of fortune transforming a penalty kill into a one-on-one -on -one with the opposition goalie. Even rarer are the occasions when the puck happens to land in front of the penalty box, just as the player is about to re-enter the game. If one or both feet are still in the penalty box, the player cannot touch the puck. If he does, he'll be thrown into the sin bin for another two minutes. Don't feel bad if you missed this one. In January 2016, Chicago Blackhawks all-star Patrick Kane made this error, and after the whistle blew, he questioned the referee, what's the call? Once you pick up the goalie's stick, you can't play the puck until you hand off the stick. A goaltender who has dropped his stick is vulnerable since he's missing one of his most critical tools for stopping shots. In this instance, one of his teammates will frequently pick up the goalkeeper's stick and return it when the opportunity presents itself. However, during the brief period in which the player holds both sticks, he's not permitted to play the puck or interfere with a member of the other side. What's the reason? Playing with two sticks is prohibited, even if one of them is a goalkeeper stick. In reality, playing while holding the goalie stick would typically be a violation of another rule limiting the size of a player's stick, but that rule is waived in this case. If the player carrying the goalie stick and his own gets involved in the play, he'll be sent to the box for two minutes. A hand pass is legal in your own zone. A whistle-stopping play for a hand pass is a typical event frequently occurring multiple times in a single game, and should be familiar to even casual viewers. But did you know that in the defensive zone, a hand pass is absolutely legal? Play can continue as long as both the player making the hand pass and the player receiving the pass are in their respective zones. The action will be blown dead if a player in his defensive zone makes a hand pass to a teammate on the other side of the blue line. A goal can be scored without the puck ever entering the net. Here's another that deals with an extremely unusual scenario. A club may move its goalie out of the crease and add another attacker in the final few minutes of a game. If a player illegally enters the ice via an illegal substitution, an early exit from the penalty box or a too many men on the ice infraction to halt an opposing team breakaway, the referee may award a goal to the attacking side. Here's an illustration. Team A has replaced its goalkeeper with an extra attacker. However, a Team B player is able to poke the puck past the defender at the point and race into the open net. A Team A player comes off the bench too soon before the player he's replacing is within 5 feet of the bench and disrupts the action. The referee gives Team B a goal despite the fact that the attacking player hasn't even shot the puck toward the goal. A team can only have one goaltender on the ice at any given time. What? Doesn't this seem self-evident? Why would a club consider having more than one goalie on the ice? Wait, that's wonderful when you say it like that. Can you picture the chaos on the ice if a team was permitted to put out a backup goaltender? Consider a 5-on-3 penalty kill with one skater and two goaltenders on the ice. It would make for some interesting games and a significant shift in approach. Actually, if there were two goalies guarding the net, goal scoring would be far lower in hockey so it's probably for the best that NHL Rule Number 5.3 exists in the NHL rulebook. A goalie cannot have black tape on the knob of his stick. 
The laws governing stick measurements for goalkeepers and other players take up three and a half pages of the NHL rulebook, with the curvature of the blade being the most prevalent infraction. However, one little known regulation is that the goalie's stick knob be covered with white tape, or tape of a color recognized by the league. When you think about it, the rationale is simple. If the goalie's stick knob was covered in black tape, it may be mistaken for the puck during a scramble around the net. To accurately evaluate whether a goal has been scored, the goal judge and other officials must have a clear feel of where the puck is. Hence, there can be no black tape on the knob of the goalkeeper's stick. NHL rules can be complicated, unlike supporting our channel, which is as simple as just subscribing. If no refs or linemen are available to officiate, players can step in. The more you read these guidelines, the more ludicrous they become. However, this is another legitimate rule in the NHL rulebook. If due to misadventure or sickness, the designated referees and linesmen are unable to arrive, the league will make every effort to identify suitable replacement officials. Otherwise, the managers or coaches of the two clubs shall agree on a referee and linesman. This is a lengthy way of saying that if there are no officials and the league is unable to recruit replacements, each team's players will have to officiate their own game. It reminds me of street hockey, where you call your own penalties in high sticks. I realize this will never happen in an NHL game, but it's difficult to conceive how players could remain objective. Would you call a penalty on a teammate on your own team, or return a goal for your own team? A team cannot simply bring in a goalie for a penalty shot. Assume your team purposefully sent too many guys over the boards and was penalized with a penalty shot. How can this coach aggravate these officials any further? By attempting to replace their starting goaltender with a backup goalie who is sitting on the bench. That appears to be a violation of the regulations, doesn't it? Technically, you can change your goalie for a penalty shot, but you can't switch back once the penalty shot is over. If coaches want to put their starting goaltender back into the game, they must wait until the next whistle or stoppage in play. Why is this the case? I'm not sure, and with this regulation, I can't even think of a plausible rationale from the league. Surprisingly, when a game does not end in overtime, coaches can switch goaltenders during the shootout. If the coach understands that one goalie is better at handling penalty shots than the other, switching to that goalie in the shootout makes sense. A new goalkeeper would likewise be fresh, having not played in the preceding 65 minutes. For more weird content, check the video on the screen to see the most bizarre careers in NHL.